I took him golf recently. I thought, I never play this game. Old man's game, never do it. But my kids play, so I want to play with him. So I go out, and I do really well. I go out on this one day, and I outpower by my instructor. I'm feeling really proud. The next day, I'm not feeling so proud. I keep putting the ball in the water again. I'm so frustrated. Put down another one. Put down another one. I don't care. I don't care what my score is. Let's do it. And finally, I was getting frustrated. He's going things like, ain't it a bitch? This is golf. And I'm going, bull. I said, this is, you're a terrible instructor. I said, because I should at least be consistent at whatever shitty level I can achieve. I said, I know I'm not Tiger Woods, but I should be able to be consistent. And you're just telling me it's difficult. Being, telling me it's difficult is not helping. Tell me what to do. He said, well, actually, you're only a little bit off. I said, could have fooled me. He said, no, you're about a millimeter or two off. I said, you're joking. He said, no, watch this. He said, I didn't teach you this yet. He said, when you approach the ball like this, he said, if you change the angle that you're attacking, there's just one or two millimeters. In the very beginning, do you see how that changes the arc? This one, instead of being on the green, by one millimeter, now you're in the water. One millimeter over here, you're in the sand. He said, and also you're hitting the ground by one millimeter sometimes. You're, you're not stroking it, just one millimeter. I thought, what a great belief system that when all hell's breaking loose and nothing's working, that you're only one millimeter off. Because most people think it's impossible, so they give up. Isn't that true? And in real life, it's true. So two days later, I'm going to see one of my clients. I do a lot of coaching, and I have a man who's the top plastic surgeon in the world. He's going through some tough times and aspects of his life. But this is a guy that gets paid by Sultan of Brunei a million dollars to fly over and do three people's faces. He is the number one plastic surgeon in the world. He can make anyone who's ugly look spectacularly beautiful. He showed me pictures of a woman who's 84 years old. He made her look 40 and gorgeous, no exaggeration. But you know what? I'm waiting for him in his office, and he's still in surgery. So he's got a new book he's creating to teach other uh, surgeons around the world. And I'm going to, and it's got pictures of, you know, the top 100 supposedly most beautiful women in the world's faces. And then men. I wasn't paying attention to that one. I just kept turning the pages, right? But I noticed something. He's got all these measurements. And he has mathematically calculated what it takes to make someone look gorgeous, man or woman. And it's a few millimeters. Interesting. For example, on a woman, the distance between the top part of your lip and your nose, this little distance, the measurement of that, if you're beautiful, gorgeous, is the same size as your eye. If it's one millimeter more, you have an average face. If it's two millimeters more, you are butt ugly. <laughs> okay, okay. The difference between butt ugly and gorgeous is two millimeters. He's got about a dozen of these little one or two millimeter changes he makes, and it's, it's a different person. It is unbelievable. So a very powerful belief to leave today with would be, nothing's working, I'm one millimeter away. What little thing do I change? And when I do, it changes everything. Because I'm heading this direction, I make this little shift. You take that out an hour from now, a day from now, a week from now, a month from now, you have a totally different destination from that direction. But the one millimeter change, I'll show you one of them right now. Check this out. Stay in the state of certainty. Some of you lost it. Intensify it, whatever it takes. Intensify Make your move. Come on. Make your move. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Now feel that in your body. Don't let go of it. Now watch. Here's the difference between being certain and being uncertain. Did you see that? Certain, uncertain. See if you can find that little spot between the two where you drop just a little bit of your chest and you feel it drop and come back up and drop it. How many can feel that difference between where you really feel it? Now intensify it and where you dropped it. Is it a tiny difference, yes or no? Yes or no? Now, could you condition yourself to feel great in this state? Yes or no? So what I want you to do is give yourself that opportunity. So the way we're going to do is very simple. We're going to go in a peak state. And then we're going to train ourselves. Because guess what? If you're in this state of certainty, state of certainty, state of certainty, and all hell's breaking loose in your life, people can't figure out, you go, move, I'll handle it. People go, he's so lucky, he's so confident. No, here's what I've created for my life, and anyone I know succeeded. I'm a 17-year-old kid from Azusa, California, with no real education other than self-education, with no background, with parents that did their best, all of them, with no money, but I did one thing. I love people, and I had an enormous demand I made upon myself, and I sculpted my mind and my emotions to get me to do whatever it would take to achieve and to contribute. But to do that, I did it by using my body and changing my focus. I did it by putting myself in a peak physiology and using what I call incantations. Can you train yourself to believe something, yes or no? Absolutely. 
How many of you ever made the fatal mistake of going to Disneyland or Disney World, and while you're there made the fatal mistake of going to a ride called It's a Small World After All? What happens for about a week after you're out of that damn place? You're still singing this thing in your head in 24 languages, right? Well, let me tell you something. How many of you have things when you want to go achieve them and this part of your voice goes, oh, it's not going to happen or forget it? How many got a voice that sometimes interrupts that good pattern? Say, I. And what you want to do is train a new one. So starting when I was 17, I started doing incantations, not affirmations. Affirmation, you go, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. What's the problem? You haven't changed your what? Your what? Physiology. If you don't change your physiology, you won't get anything. So an incantation is not only you speak it, but you embody what you're saying with all the intensity you can. And you do it with enough repetitions that it sticks in your head. Like it's a small world, now the conversation in your head is always the same and it gives you what you want. So you use your body and your voice. So 17 years ago, I started doing things. I was working for Jim Rohn, this speaker. And I was 17 years old. I had long hair, minestrone soup, acne on my face. And I was trying to call on Bear Stearns type of people and convince them why they should go to this man's seminar and be more successful. I was driving a 1968 Volkswagen that I had earned at $40 a week as a janitor. The only way I did it was park far from the building and then go in and I love people and I believe but I put myself in state and I was able to influence people that were far more successful than I was at the time. I would do something that I still do backstage and have done for 23 years because I don't hope I'm going to be in a good state. I demand it. So I do an incantation using my whole body. I'd say, I now command my subconscious mind to direct me in helping as many people as possible life today to better their lives by giving me the strength, the emotion, the persuasion, the humor, the brevity, whatever it takes to show these people and get these people to change their lives now. And I would do that literally driving in my Volkswagen to a meeting in L.A. on the freeway for 40 minutes. People are looking at me. I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. They're going, I know he's a serial killer. I know he is. But by the time I entered that room, when two people meet, if there's rapport, the person who's most certain will always influence the other person. And I was totally certain, and they were trying to get revved up to certainty. Do you agree with this, yes or no? I do another one because I was poor. I changed my mindset. I kept doing things, but I never got beyond it. I'd say God's wealth is circulating in my life. His wealth flows to me in avalanches of abundance. All my needs, desires, and goals are met instantaneously by infinite intelligence. For I'm one with God and God is everything. And I would imagine the abundance of my life and I would feel so grateful. And a year later I went from making $38,000 a year to making a million dollars a year in one year. Because successful people do what failures won't. You follow me on this? You know?